just to kick us off, I would love to take the next five minutes or so to do a quick icebreaker with everyone. And it is super, super simple. Uh, the questions that I'd love for you to answer are, what is your name, your neighborhood, and what is one way that you are taking care of yourself uh, and others this week or others this week? Um, and anyone can go, we won't get through everyone because it'll just be five minutes, but uh, you can just unmute yourself and share your answer. Uh, I'll go first just to model it. My name is Ellie, I live in Bridgeport, and one way that I have been taking care of myself this week is making sure I take advantage of the sun when we have it and uh, going on walks. So if you would like to share, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll just do this for the next five minutes, get to know each other a little better before we get started. Sheila, Hyde Park, and like Ellie, I am walking a lot. Hi, I'm Natalie, um, neighborhood East Garfield Park, and I am eating what I want to eat. I had not been before, and now I'm like, forget it. If I want a piece of bread, I'll eat it. So that's what I'm doing. I wanted to say that I've been taking pictures of the little pieces of nature in my forest, um, like mushrooms that never have grown in my yard before. So now with that little bit of grounding, I'd love to turn to uh, our panel for the evening. Uh, so once again, just want to share, we are joined by Sebastian and uh, Sebastian Hidalgo and Jackie Serrato. Um, to kick us off, I would love Sebastian and Jackie, if you can briefly just introduce yourselves, uh, share, you know, what your work looks like nowadays. Uh, and what your relationship to Little Village or the Southwest Side is. Sebastian, maybe you can kick us off. Hi, everybody. My name is Sebastian. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. I think it's a really important one. Uh, I grew up in Pilsen on 23rd Street, and my relationship to La Vita is, is, is the same as my relationship growing up in on 23rd Street. Um, what my work looks like uh, in the last year. Yeah. It, is it a year? Yeah, it is a year. Um, it looks a lot like doing visual research, doing research, reading a ton of books, reading as much as possible on Chicago, even though I'm born here and I have that experience. It's never a bad idea to catch up on, on what's been said about your neighborhood, about your people, your, your culture. And that's what primarily what it looks like uh, within the last year, along with taking pictures for uh, a variety of news outlets, um, you know, COVID related stuff, inequity related stuff, uh, you know, everything that requires some visual context to it. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jackie Serrato. Um, I call myself a barrio journalist, which means that, I, you know, I'm a journalist from the neighborhood. Um, I was born and raised in the Little Village neighborhood on 26th and Sawyer. Uh, Adam Toledo was killed on 24th and Sawyer, two blocks away from where I came up from my stomping grounds. Uh, so th this has definitely hit very close to home. And it's been interesting, right, to to both be on, on the inside, right? Um, in the sense that, um, you know, I, I'm hearing what everybody is, is talking about within the neighborhood, uh, what neighbors are saying, uh, what people who knew Adam are saying, and, and just how, how the whole incident is being interpreted internally. But at the same time, as a media person, um, uh, you, know, you know, taking a step back and distancing myself a little bit from the incident so that I can as best as possible have an, uh, an objective view on, um, on the events that took place and also um, to, to analyze how the city at large um, is coping with, um, with, with the recent events with the killing of, of Adam Toledo and other police killings that have happened uh, recently. Um, we, at Southside Weekly, we put out an issue uh, that was dedicated to the life of Adam Toledo. 
And uh, at the time, this was before the COPA video was, was made public. So in a way it was a, a risky move that we were, that we were taking. Um, but we understood that we were talking about a 13 year old and that the media was already gonna take care of uh, criminalizing him. So we wanted to bring some balance to that and remind people that this was a child, right? And that, um, you know, his life and his death are representative of, of the environment that he came up in. And uh, as residents, as taxpayers, um, to, to some extent, we're all responsible for what happens to our children. Um, and I can go more into that um, as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah, and Jackie, just jumping right off into that um, point that you made about media sort of criminalizing Adam. Um, I want to take a moment to just unpack some of the harmful narratives that have emerged around Adam's killing. Uh, I am wondering, you know, who is crafting these narratives and why, to what end, and what is their impact? I think uh, it's important to understand uh, how crime is reported in the first place. Um, as many people here are already aware, you know, after an incident takes place, there is a police report, right, that, that an officer fills out. Um, and then internal affairs, uh, which is like the, the PR, um, uh, the PR department of, of the Chicago Police Department, they turn that police report into a press release that is then, you know, sent to the media, uh, the established media. Uh, so then the media in turn takes the police account as truth for the most part and prints it, uh, sometimes verbatim. Um, so, you know, the, the police killing of, of the 13 year old was initially reported by the media in very general terms, um, talking about a quote unquote armed confrontation because that, that is the, the phrase that the CPD used, that it was an armed confrontation. So when I think of, an ar of, of any type of confrontation, I am thinking that there is some type of exchange taking place, right? Um, so the, the shot spotter uh, was activated in Little Village, and this is technology that um, has microphones and algorithms, and it's you know very high-tech, um, devices that, that can hear that can hear when um, when uh, uh, gunshots go off in in a certain part of the city. So the shot spotter was was activated in Little Village. The police were immediately deployed to the area, um, and they essentially arrived to the scene with their with their guns drawn. Um, so so they they pursue Adam Toledo right, uh, who's trying to, to run away. They tell him to stop two or three times. Um, at the same time, like shining their strobe light on, their strobe light on him. And uh, Adam turns with his hands up and he gets shot in the chest. Um, his hands are, em he's empty handed essentially. Uh, and of course there are debates about whether he was holding a gun moments leading up to his death and a gun was found on the scene. Um, however, at no point was a weapon ever raised. Uh, at no point was a weapon ever pointed at, um, at any officer. Um, I think it's, what's interesting is that his boyhood innocence was immediately put into question. Um, you know, there were suggest suggestions that perhaps uh, he brought it upon himself, right? Um, People started to blame his mom and uh, his family situation. And uh, this is not new, right? Um, we were here about seven years ago with Laquan McDonald, right? Um, where his uh, youthful innocence was called into question, where his childhood and his family situation was scrutinized. And like other police shootings of, of black and brown youth, right? We see social media photos of them emerge right where they're either holding a gun, which is a second amendment right, or they're smoking weed, right? Or, 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 or they're in, in situations that um, are, are meant, or that, you know, whether it's the media or whether it's society as a whole, um, th these images surfacing are meant to criminal, criminalize 
our young people. Um, but, but I think what's really important is that in the Adam Toledo case is that his parents were not notified um, that he had been shot by police until 48 hours later or so. Um, the police report did not disclose that he was 13. So the, the, pub, the family essentially found out at the same time as, as the public that a 13 year old had been, had been the victim of, of this incident. And that's when, you know, the public had a range of emotions in response. You know, there was, people were understandably upset. There were a, a lot of questions. Um, you know, people were uh, traumatized essentially by, by, by the situation. And uh, it took a while for COPA to, to show the video to the family and then to, to release it to the public. Um, but before the, the COPA video was released, there had already been a narrative built around uh, Adam Toledo being a quote unquote gangbanger, which by the way, he was not in the gang database. Uh, otherwise I think the city would have possibly mentioned that. Um, and you know, it wasn't just the, the police department uh, police report. Uh, it was also the Cook County State's Attorney's Office um, one of their prosecutors, I believe it was in bond court, mentioned on the record, right, that, that Adam Toledo had his, um, had his hand on, on the right side of his waist and that he was holding a gun, right? So, so all of these are official accounts uh, shaping the narrative before the video, before the evidence is even uh, made public. You know, so um, I, I, I really think it's important to, to understand how the story could be manipulated very, very early on. Uh, when we think that facts are coming out, um, you know, they're not always facts. Sometimes they are very much influenced uh, by people who are in positions of power. So um, I'll stop there and um, I'm gonna let Sebastian talk. I, I think you really touch on a lot of good points there. And my biggest concern, my biggest worry is just the role of photography in all of this. You have uh, police body cam footage that is not going anywhere. And the role of photographers and photography has never been as important as it is today. Now, photography, is, it's, it's a complicated relationship because it's always had this relationship to tragic videos, the tragicness of it. And I even questioned how that video was released, what was shown, what was frozen, what was edited, you have those um, uh, big red arrows that point to specific things. Um, and that really gets intake for its face value. It doesn't share uh, what Jackie was saying, you know, the, the spot scanner or the fact that a 13 year old was shot and killed by police. I think those things often get missed when tragedy is at the forefront of, of the people's perspective. I worry that, um, you know, while more of these videos will come out to hold police accountable, people will become too desensitized without it being balanced. Now, photography can really play a crucial role in that and really trying to figure out like, what are the facts? You have a 13 year old, right? Just for an example, um, you, get, you have to look at the demographic of Little Village, it's history. It's predominantly made up of young people. And that's why it was felt at the heart of what made, what makes Little Village a Little Village. You bring family values into that 13 year olds. I remember my mom prepping me growing up to always be afraid of the police. It was never like a boogeyman. It was always, I'm gonna call the cops if you don't go to sleep, right? Which to me at the time, I thought it was, you know, a joke, but when I grew up, I realized that that level of, um, of I want to say, tuning or raising a child to be weary of the police came from a very fearful place. And we're seeing that in real time now, right? So, you know, I believe that we would have to start treating these videos as tragic as they, as they are, as police quotes, as poli police facts, because it's also 
they also operate very similarly to how photographers operate. They go, they take some photos. Uh, photography is naturally subjective. So there's a lot of information that's excluded. Uh, there's a lot of uh, blurry lines between what is considered factual and, and, and emotional information, or in other words, art and journalism. Um, and things are only shown with intention. Now, as photographers, we, we can also play a role in providing the thoroughness of, of Little Village and its facts. And, you know, I think we can do a lot about that. And, and I know that we're going to talk about um, just what we can do in order to kind of balance the tragedy of those videos. Um, but I'll wait until there's time for that. Yeah, thank you both. I, I want to shift our attention from some of um, the harm that we're discussing now and talk about some reporting that, um, you know, really prioritizes the needs of those who are most impacted by the issue. So, um, Jackie, you know, the Southside Weekly has put out pieces on Adam Toledo's killing and not to mention your ongoing coverage of police uh, violence that I find to be uh, exemplary um, for this topic. So can you talk a little bit more about some of the editorial decisions that you made as a newsroom about that coverage? Uh, like what questions did you confront? Uh, yeah, so uh, as, as I had mentioned earlier, we, we dedicated a, an issue to Adam Toledo's uh, life and, uh, and, and, and his case having been killed by police. Um, the, the cover of the issue was uh, a beautiful illustration um, that depicts Adam Toledo with his, you know, he, his eyes look like they're smiling. Um, you can see that his, his face is that of, you know, of a boy, of, of a young teenager. Uh, the, the, the colors that were selected were very, very soft, very juvenile. Um, uh, and it, it was important, right, to, to portray Adam Toledo as a 13-year-old. I think that was definitely the, the, the goal of, of our visual team at Southside Weekly. Um, and it's something that I think all, all of us editors at Southside Weekly uh, felt was, was really crucial. Um, we, we didn't do as much reporting because uh, we were getting reactions from the community. You know, we, we ran a couple of op-eds from, uh, you know, community members from Little Village and Back of the Yards, which are very similar communities in terms of, of, its, of their makeup. Uh, you know, they're, they're both immigrant, working class, and uh, very uh, industrial or post-industrial. Um, so, you know, we ran a piece uh, an op-ed called We Are Adam Toledo, uh, which was the, the lived experience of a, of a South Side youth who, you know, grew up in, the ho in a single family, in, I'm sorry, in, in, in a home with a, with a single mother um, who didn't have a lot of resources and started hanging out with, with the wrong crowd. Um, but, but he spoke of, you know, different adults in, who came into his life and encouraged them to you know, to, to get a job, to, to pursue uh, more productive activities, to get an internship. And, um, you know, he, he was eventually able to, um, to do more productive things with his life. And, you know, now he's, he's a community leader, at, you know, in back of the yards. I'm talking about Berto Aguayo. Um, so when we say we are Adam Toledo, I think we're, we're talking about it I think we're, we're saying that in, in two senses. The first one being that there are a lot of, of young people, black and brown youth, who may identify and do identify with Adam Toledo, Adam Toledo and just the, the lack of opportunities in, in the community, the lack of city investment in racialized communities. But also when we say we are Adam Toledo, we're also taking responsibility, right, as taxpayers um, because this city only spends 1% of its budget on violence prevention and only spends single digit percentages on, you know, uh, on social services, on mental health, on, um, on programs and jobs for our young people. Um, 
So, you know, you, you could you could look at it at this, you know, different ways. Um, you can look at it as, you know, young young kids taking personal responsibility for the situations and the conditions that they live in, but also, you know, they can be fully responsible for the environment that they grew up in. I think we all have to take some degree of responsibility uh, because as a city, we're not investing in our young people. A lot of our young people are feeling lost. Um, they're not feeling optimistic about the future. And so they're going out and finding a sense of belonging, a sense of agency um, with other groups of people that look like them, but um, you know, within context that can be very uh, harmful. Um, so I think I kind of um, went on a tangent there, but aside from you know the 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 two op-eds that that we published, um, which by the way in, included a critique of of the columnist uh, Eric Zorn. I, I believe he's a columnist from the Chicago Tribune who was uh, very critical of Adam, even as he was telling us, you know, that the facts weren't out yet, you know, he was still speculating about his life and, and suggesting that, you know, perhaps the shooting had been justified when he also wrote another column about, um, you know, that, that kid, Kyle Rittenhouse, right, who was uh, this teenager, this white teenager, right, who was openly carrying and using an AK-47 and who actually killed people. And he was actually given the benefit of the doubt by the same columnist, but by, uh, by the media, by a lot of media sources uh, and, and the police department. Um, so the op-eds were also a response to, to that particular columnist. In, in addition to that, um, we included a timeline of, um, of CPD killings of children who are under 16. And uh, I mean, we noticed that there's definitely a pattern. This isn't new. Uh, this goes back decades. And um, we've seen an uptick of, of CPD, CPD killings of of young people um, as of the 2000s. Um, I don't know if this is a, a trend that is going to grow or get worse, but I think it's something that needs to, to get looked into. Thank you. Um, so Jackie, you've already mentioned um, a couple ingredients of reporting on this story and on police violence more broadly that make for more successful coverage. Um, for example, um, the decision to elevate voices of people living in Little Village or nearby. Um, I'm wondering what are some of the other ingredients for a successful story around either the Adam Toledo story in particular or police violence taking a broader view? So, boss. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Jackie. Uh, I, no, no, you're good. <laughs> you, know, you know, we can take uh, the police account at face value. Um, we need to seek out, if possible, eyewitnesses, um, you know, people who were close to the incident and possibly witnessed, them, witnessed it themselves. Uh, we, we need to rely on body cam, for, body cam footage and it needs to be released immediately. You know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't have to wait two, three, four weeks for it to come out. And, and we don't need CPD's commentary on the actual video footage. Just give us the raw footage I think we can we can all draw our own conclusions. Um, go ahead, Sebastian. Yeah, you know, I, I as much as I, I really admire the work that the Sasai Weekly does, and I also want to shout out other journalists that have been doing work in La Vita, Maria Smudio uh, and Carlos Ballesteros. They've been really looking at it from different angles, and I think that's also important. Um, but I'm also uh, you know, I also worry about, or I'm curious about just how people read the news themselves. Um, you know, I think as journalists, we forget that we're always kind of dissecting information and trying to expand that. And, and that's our job is what we got to do. But, you know, you know, somebody who works like uh, an hourly job, comes home tired, probably doesn't want to read the news and, and, you know, or doesn't want to look at the news. And, and I worry that when they see videos of, of its just rawness of it, it's always going to be traumatizing. 
Um, but if we if if we can, you know, guide people and and just say like this is you know uh, how an option to read the news or this is how you can dissect information by viewing this one video or or viewing this one fact i think that's also something that is is crucial even in uh, uh, as journalists but the photography aspect of it is something that i always worry about because i feel like if if it's just the video that we're only seeing it leaves too much room for it to be the facts of things and there are other visuals that need to play a role in just kind of contextualizing that um and you know it could be anything from spending time in little village getting to know people in a way that is uh, authentic and and based on on everything that you've researched and and just spending as much time in the communities that you want to serve as possible i think as a photographer i try to uh deepen my photography even more uh, by conducting surveys not anything scientific it's more about you know i'm going to generate a list of questions about this particular thing and just generate people's opinions and let that inform the way that i take pictures right and it's just an effort just to be as thorough with the in, uh, with the visual information as much as i am with the research elements of information that's a crucial thing that i feel like is often missed in 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 newsrooms and a big part of that is because there's just a lack of photo editors you know like uh, excluding the major media publications that are out there photo editing is it's almost non-existent within other realms you have great photo editors mm -hmm. but i fear that it's not simply enough um, and I think if we are guided or if there's more pathways to photo editing, we can cover that visual information to accompany horrific videos like the ones that we are, it, that is becoming common in police body cam footage, right? It should never be the case, but in the reality that we live in now, that is something that we, uh, I encourage everybody just to, to kind of look into. It's to hold visuals, uh, is to weigh them as much as words, because they're also a part of what makes journalism journalism. I can I can also respect you know uh, newsrooms' decisions not to show the video, not to show COPA videos because they can definitely be traumatizing, um, especially for the community that's most affected. Um, however, in in the case of Adam. Uh, the community really wanted to see the video and and a lot of it had to do with you know the, just this police police narrative that wasn't making sense locally like you know pe people uh, had too many questions people wanted to see the video uh just so they could see if if the police was really telling the truth and i think we should also respect that right um uh, like why should the city or the police department decide you know, what, when they're going to make the evidence available to the family or to the public. Um, I think that's something that shouldn't be up to them. Um, and uh, especially when it comes to uh, police abuse, um, police misconduct, it's important for, for the public to, to be aware and to, to, ha to have access to the evidence. Definitely. So I, you are already hitting on some of these points. I do want to elevate a couple comments in the chat. So uh, Ruby says, speaking of youth getting brutalized on the streets, why would reporters share these triggering images on Twitter? Um, shares that in particular, Jackie, you saw a tweet that you sent um, that had a photo of Adam. Um, asks, how can we be genuine in our reporting violence in our black and brown communities if we showcase their trauma? online and uh, Natalie says, as a black person, I don't feel like viewing police killings does anything for me. Um, so wondering if you have responses to those comments besides um, what you've already shared for, yeah, for I both. Think, I think um, those perspectives are completely valid. Um, so, you know, before COPA released uh, the video of, of Adam's shooting, um, there was a leaked uh, screenshot, screenshot, screen grab of the video that was already being circulated on Facebook 
and Instagram among community members, right? Um, and what, what's interesting is that people were um, people were interpreting the image in, in different ways. Um, so you know, I felt that that it was important to tweet this image out, hoping to pressure Copa to release the footage because they kept making you know coming up with excuses as to why they couldn't make this footage available to the public. At first, they were they were blaming the the family. But I, on my end, I was hearing that the family wanted this footage to be released. Um, so, you know, after I tweeted that image under my own account, not Southside Weeklies, um, it, you know, it got it got it got around even more. And the next day, uh, Copa released a video. I'm not saying it was a direct result of of me publishing that that image, um, but I do think it, it might have had something to do with it. Um, also, I, I didn't really need the image to be verified because I was very extremely familiar with with the with the alley where where Adam was shot. Um, I had already seen multiple photos of Adam that his family had shown to me. Uh, so as soon as I saw the image and I saw the timestamp, it seemed uh, very authentic to me. And um, although it, it may seem like a risk, I feel very confident that. Uh, this was a genuine screenshot from the Copa footage, and that perhaps, um, you know, putting it on Twitter, where other journalists and other powerful people are at, uh, that perhaps it could have um, pressured Copa to release the footage. Um, Sebastian, any thoughts? Yeah, I think that that also touches on the base of the power that photography can have. Um, I mean, even if it was a screenshot or a video, that's that's photography. I, but I think that uh, um, you know, I I just I worry about people's um, health, is their mental capacity to view those images, um, to a point where if if they become too desensitized to it, it's just not going to have any weight anymore. Those videos are always going to come out either way. Uh, there's nothing that we can really do about that, at least me personally, as an independent photographer. Um, but what I can do is, is balance images out with something more thorough so that they're not left for misinformation or conspiracy theories or um, uh, premature opinions to just kind of run rampant. Photography can really just pile that information on so that people can do whatever they want with that you know, with information that is factual, desensitizing and or traumatizing. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that's the nature of it. And, and I think there, this isn't anything new. Photography was used as evidence, even in during the Vietnam War, you had graphic images, you had all these things, but the photographers taking the images always wanted to balance that out, you know, and in most cases, photography isn't there's a whole team behind it of what gets published and what doesn't get published. Um, and usually the case when things get published, they're very violent. Without balance, you, people lose interest very quickly. And, and I think in, in Adam Toledo's case, we're talking about it in Chicago all the time, but everybody else, it, it was last week's news. Uh, you know, and other people wanted to move on because it was traumatizing. They don't want to, they don't want to sit with that. But if I think we provide inf a visual information that kind of keeps people engaged, powerful, compelling images, emotional images, um, that is, uh, that's something important that we want. We want that as, uh, as viewers and as, as journalists. Um, so before we head off into uh, our exercise for the evening, I want to ask, you know, I imagine that as people witness stories being misreported and harmful narratives being propagated, they might be wondering what they can do in response. Uh, so what is something anybody could do to try and hold a news outlet accountable? What are some of the ways that you can convince journalists to change something? You can write letters to editors. Um, and those are, if, if, you know, the Chicago Tribune, they accept letters. And if, you know, that's something that people can, 
can do if they feel compelled to do so. You know, or they could pick up a camera too, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, we love to get feedback from our readers. We, we want to know how they're reacting to our stories. Um, you know, if they have suggestions on how we can improve our coverage. So um, we don't run letters to the editor, letters to the editor, but we do run op-eds. And um, you know, you don't have to be a quote-unquote white-collar professional to be able to write an op-ed. Um, if you have lived experience, if you have a perspective, if you can back up your claims, you know, we can publish you. So that's just one way. Um, other ways is to, of course, uh, get into journalism, get into writing, get into media making, like Sebastian just just mentioned. Um, I think, I mean, when, when it comes to the case of, of or, or seeking justice for George Floyd, um, you know, it was a civilian, a regular resident, uh, a, a young woman, you know, who who decided to to take fit to to take the footage to take video of of George Floyd. Um, of his last moments uh, before police um, ended his life. So, you know, as regular everyday citizens, we can always, you know, pull out our phone and um, we can record, uh, we can document um, how, how our community is, our community's conditions, how they're being treated, um, you know, any instance of abuse, but also of celebration. And, um, you know, I think it's, it is important to balance you know the bad with with some good stuff and there's a lot of good stuff happening in our neighborhoods um so you know documenting everything that's happening in our community that's that also counts as media and uh that can also be empowering for our communities thank you so much to you both for this um grounding before we move into a, a bit of a more hands-on exercise um I want to just pause here and ask if anyone has any final questions before we move on. Right. I, I had a question really quick for Jackie. Um, you know, how do you navigate, you know, you mentioned the, the negative comments that, you know, people were starting to articulate about you know, Adam or about his, the family or, you know, about the the gangs in the neighborhood, like, how do you navigate that as, as a journalist and as someone who manages, you know, a Facebook page as well? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, yeah, it's it's been difficult. It's been, um, it's difficult not to get emotional, right? Um, but when it comes to, to La Villita neighborhood in particular, uh, it's, it's very important to understand its history, um, its history as a neighborhood, but also the history of, of Mexicans as a people, right? Um, Mexicans as a people, as a collective, carry a lot of trauma. You know, uh, Mexicans as a collective uh, are colonized people. Um, these are Native Americans that were effectively colonized about 500 years ago. And there's a lot of, of, of historical and ancestral trauma that we still continue to carry. Um, add to that trauma, the fact that we just had four years of Trump who was actively denigrating and actively criminalizing Mexican people and brown people, right? And you have, you get like this toxic mix of, um, you know, of, of people who are traumatized, who don't want to ruffle feathers, who want to fly under the radar because there is currently a system that is a, that is attacking them or they're feeling attacked, right? Um, so there, there's definitely um, a, a, a large sector of, of the Little Village community who, um, who want to feel accepted. They want to feel accepted by society who you know, don't want to be thought of as, as criminals who want to blend into the mainstream, you know, um, w without having a critical lens of how they're perceived as, um, as racialized or as ethnic people, right? Or many times, 
being completely ignorant of their history um, and not, not understanding how systems have historically worked against, you know, Mexicans, the Mexican collective, let's, let's just call it that. Um, you know, adds to that uh, feelings of, of anti-Blackness, which are, which are very real. Um, there's, you know, I feel like the community as a whole is dealing with so many conflicting um, ideas and conflicting feelings. And um, as a journalist, as someone who had the privilege to go to a four-year college, someone who has the privilege of being well-read and um, knowledgeable of our history, um, I take it upon myself to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. I take it upon myself to attend community meetings and, and try to understand the local perspective, um, to inform others of you know, historical facts that they may have never ever considered in their lives. Um, there are just so many internal conversations that are happening, you know, as everything else is happening. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have like the right answer for you or a straight answer for you. Um, but the point is that there is a lot of internal work that is happening. Um, and as, as a journalist, there's only so much that I can do. Um, if I want to cover my community as quote unquote objectively as possible, I, I also am careful not to get overly involved emotionally, if that makes any sense. Um, it's a very weird um, and difficult balance to keep. Yeah, uh, can, I, can I just add to, to that a little bit, Jackie? Um, you know, I, I, I really think that there, there's a lot of, I, I, in books, especially in, in academia, uh, everything about Chicago or the, the, the Mexican experience in particular, there's a sentence that's in every single book that says it is often underrepresented and misunderstood. And that's as far as the sentence goes. And for somebody that, that kind of grew up in, in Pilsen, I realized that we have terms like más caído de vez más bonito as like a harmful thing for us. But I think in most cases, people know about the, the things that they're, they're being oppressed by. Now the challenge is the, the determinants that they are of, often faced with, you know, uh, low paying jobs, working seven days out of the week. Um, you know, uh, dealing with asthma. Um, I think as somebody that grew up in the neighborhood, being wanting to invest in, in those narratives and trying to speak to those narratives, you often find yourself very close to the, to the issues that you're trying to address. And as, photogra as a photographer, that grants me the ability to be really emotionally involved uh, for the sake of images Right, and then being a little bit distanced for the sake of trying to find as much information as possible into, into something like that. Um, but I think the challenges are there. And I think it's just really hard to just give people the time to, to really say, hey, you have options here. Hey, your solutions come from a very pure place. Often those solutions come from, you know, and particularly in my case, Mexico or the, uh, the uh, um, the native peoples in Nuevo León. Um, you know, those ideas are often said in public meetings and in uh, public discussion, but they don't really have any teeth because there's this misinformation that, you know, linguistics isolation or a misunderstanding of what people define solution as. So it, there's like nothing really happens and. Dr. David Ansel really kind of capitalized it or said it better than I can say it. He said, this isn't history repeating itself. It's just history continuing to do its dirty work. And that kind of stuck with me a little bit, you know, because it's absolutely true is that we've been dealing with this for so long and now it's, it almost feels like a, somebody pressed the restart button just so it to, to continue forward. Um, but I try not to, um, undermine my community members. I, I think people are very knowledgeable uh, uh, about the solutions that, that they need, except they just don't really have a place in that table. And that's where the problems come from. Um, 
So I think, you know, as journalists, we can, I like the term barrio journalist because it really puts you in that position. Um, I'm well read. I have certain privileges. I also have certain traumas that are very similar to a lot of people. I can go to somebody across the aisle and be like, hey, let me have a cup of coffee with you sometime and let me try to explain this to you in the most thorough way possible. Here's some images. You know, that's essentially what I can do best. I wish I could do more. I'm trying to do more, um, but it's really hard. And people have, you know, they have their ideas and I think those, are, those should be celebrated and made real. Um, thank you both Sebastian and Jackie for, for speaking on that. And thank you to everyone in the chat leaving comments and questions. I feel like you're really helping us animate the dialogue here. So um, now that we have heard from two journalists about this issue, we want to turn it to you and uh, ask you how you think media outlets should cover uh, police violence. Uh, so to do this, we'll be breaking you up into groups of about three to four people and asking you to come up with some declarations. Uh, declarations are just statements that express how you expect media outlets to cover this topic. Uh, so a declaration, for example, could be media outlets and reporters must be accountable to their own racial biases. Just to give an example. Welcome back, everyone. We'll start to do a little share out in a little bit. All right, and I think that was the minute ending because everyone is coming back in. <laughs> um, welcome, welcome back. Um, I would love to take the next of a uh, little bit of time that we have together to just hear what declarations your groups came up with. And uh, if you didn't get a chance to come up with any declarations, which is totally fine, I know 20 minutes goes by super fast. Um, just want to hear some of the reactions, thoughts, anything that struck you from your conversation. Anyone want to share? I, I could share real quick. I, I, I made an effort to just kind of summarize the conversation a little bit. So I'm gonna try my best not to butcher it. Uh, but here it goes. News needs to be 360. It's about uh it's 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 about the lived experience because the lived experience is the balance and you should be nuanced uh, we expect reporters to ask deeper questions and get to the root of each story and neighborhood uh it's about being part of the solution and not being a part of the problem i hope i didn't butcher it Who else would like to share? Uh, I can go for our group. Um, so I was in a group with Susan, Terry, and Jesus. And um, so I, I'm really sorry if my notes are sloppy, but we had a, a really good discussion about things that we would like to see. Um, and, and a lot of it does start with accountability for um, newsrooms. Like um, one of the things is like, a, and speaks to, you know, things that have already been said, but um, just a desire to see um, reporting on um, on these things in, in an authentic voice, um, whether it's, uh, you know, having a journalist that can speak to the experience and someone, you know, with those, uh, with, with, the, with the conviction and desire to um, really hear from the community. And so that also means like being deliberate and who you're, how you're sourcing the story um, you, there and just being willing to say like, actually, we, we don't need this, this quote from the FOP president, you know what I mean? And really, um, and going off of that, another thing was knowing when to step back. Um, you know, Hazard's brought a great point up about seeing um, families uh, of those whose uh, children have been lost to police violence. They're at these vigils, they're mourning, 
And there are journalists, whether it's, um, you know, reporters or photojournalists, and uh, they're being photographed, they're being uh, asked questions. And there are people uh, who are, whether family or, or not, uh, they're grieving. And um, it just kind of, uh, journalists knowing when it's time to, to step back and, and not push uh, and really give people space. And of course, you know, there's a whole conversation about uh, ethics there. And then the third thing uh, was a discussion about, um, you know, how we can hold journalists and newsrooms accountable. And one thing is sort of um, calling more folks into conversations like these. Um, you know, are people at the very top, like the editors, the ones on the masthead, like are they going to, um, you know, discussions like these, right? And the need. For that to happen and of course that takes a lot of self-initiative um so i understand that but um yeah it's just how impactful that can be to hear from people who are saying like you know your coverage is traumatizing us and um here's you know what we don't like about it and how we think we can change and um and so again i know it also takes self-initiation to sort of seek out ways that they can change but um yeah, looking at my notes, uh, sorry if I rambled, but I, I think that that kind of sums, sums up why uh, everywhere we got to. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, anyone else? I think we have time for one more group to share. Um, I can share our group. Um, so we talked about um, in the importance of centering the communities, including that um, the people um, in your reporting, should, the people doing the reporting should be from or familiar with the areas and the history should be, the history of that should be included in the context of the stories, including like the history of the neighborhoods, the history of, in this case, Mexican people, um, as well as um, we were talking about including the political context and the moment that we're in that carried over from the last year and the last four years. Um, that there should be um, diversity in your sources, including of race, age, income. And um, also when you report on an urgent story like this, that it's important to, um, to not be extracted in order. So when you engage people who just go through something like this, maintain relationships when you do, when they do share with you. So keep following up with them and how they may um, respond to the trauma and how they, you know, recover and heal or decisions that they make in response to it. Um, and then when you bring up sensitive issues such as anti-Blackness or divisions on issues of policing within communities, give um, space to understanding where these tensions come from in one-on-one -on -one personal conversations. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, it's really warming to hear everyone's thoughts. Um, if you, I, I've just been very quickly trying to take notes on everyone's contributions because they um, are, are great and I would love to capture them. So if your group didn't get a chance to write down uh, any of your declarations, we do wanna hang on to those again because it really helps us be responsive um, to your needs. Uh, so if you have a minute, just feel free to drop them into either the chat or the agenda. Um, and I will, I will start to close it out for the evening. I know I have kept you all over time already. Um, just want to start off by thanking everyone who joined today. I, I, again, like I mentioned, I know this is a tricky subject and I uh, just really appreciate having the space to talk through the impact of narrative with you all. Uh, extra special thanks to Sebastian and Jackie for uh, participating in the panel, sharing your insights. Really appreciate having a journalist perspective so that we can think about uh, how, to, how to hold outlets accountable. Um, and that is it for me, Sebastian and Jackie. Anything you would like to share before we go? Um, I'd, I'd like to invite people to read Southside Weekly um, you know, we have uh, our newspaper is free that you can pick up at, you know, any uh, newspaper stand. Uh, we're all, we also have a website at southsideweekly.com and we're always accepting contributions. So if you've wanted to be, or if you are a journalist, a writer, an artist, it's a good opportunity to get your, your name out there. 
to get your message out there and to get some exposure too. Sebastian, I think you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to thank everybody. And, and if anybody is really interested in photography or in, in just kind of documenting their own communities, uh, please reach out. I'm more than happy to uh, help give a little guidance. Um, I'm really independent, so I really I don't have a, a a newspaper to plug, except for the Southside Weekly. You should definitely go read that. Um, but you can always reach me via email, and I'll put it in the chat or on Twitter, and I'm pretty responsive. So I encourage everybody to do that. Beautiful. Thank you both. Thanks again to everyone. Uh, we'll leave it there. And uh, I hope you have a beautiful rest of your Thursday evening. Thanks for spending some of it with us. Thanks, everyone. Good night.